Um, this is from Helen Keller, who's a famous American novelist. Alone we can do so little, together we can do so much. So um, she didn't let the fact that she was blind and deaf stop her from achieving a bachelor's in arts and went on to be a very famous novelist. So hopefully after the end of this talk and this session, you'll see what I mean. So, this is a trainee, the start of their job. They've got a lot of energy and enthusiasm and they want to get involved in things to enhance their CV and maybe gain some skills along the way. So their consultant has given them a few projects to do. So they've gone to pull two to 300 sets of notes and carry out this audit on their own without much guidance. And often this can be difficult, it can be frustrating, and it can be a lonely place. So we've actually got a network in the UK and internationally of registrars and non-trainees who are in hospitals in positions where they can actually collect data for multi-center studies. So it makes sense that we actually use that network. One of the things that trainees find on their own can be challenging is the ability to carry out research in a robust way um, methodologically robust and the network that this group forms allows people to tap into the research methodology expertise to design studies that can be methodologically robust that can be carried out in a large number of patients in multi-center studies this could lead to studies that complete quickly um, better recruitment it can lead to benefit to the unit who have the reputation of unit of trainees contributing to research the patients, of course, can benefit from research that's completed quicker and with greater power. And for the individual, they can gain some academic competencies along the way. Um, they can practice designing a research question. And hopefully this will allow them to become a workforce in the future, which will allow the delivery of clinical trials alongside routine clinical practice, which is something that we've had talks about the whole of this morning. So BURST stands for British Urology Researchers and Surgical Training. This is a network for us. So we're an international network of urological registrars, urology specialty doctors, core surgical trainees, foundation doctors, medical students, and urological consultants. We're interested in producing high quality collaborative research and audit and provide the education to do this. And one of the key aspects of this is that we're trainee led. So um, we set about some working principles on how we operate, and these can be found on the website, so if anyone wants to find out more information about how we operate, they're available. And we have an advisory panel um, of some renowned urologists, academics, and clinicians who advise us in our projects. We have some methodological input from a statistician, um, anesthetics and perioperative input, and we have a biomedical scientist on the board as well. Um, we've got a core committee, which, as you can see, is um, full of registrars from different parts of the country. So some from England, some from Scotland, and some from Wales. Um, we have um, a bigger workforce now. We've expanded due to the um, larger scale of our projects. And we've got some core surgical trainee representatives. And the core trainees are a really important group who contribute to our projects. We've also got some medical students as well. Some of the software we use to interact with each other in this national, or in fact now international, network are software that are actually open source that companies like IBM use. So Slack is a great um, development that our communications officer has brought in. And we also use things like Google Hangouts and Skype. So the question is, how do you as trainees stay in the loop? Well. We try to make it as easy as possible. So we do send out a newsletter once to twice a year. And we have a Twitter account, which is at Burst Urology. If you're not following us yet, please do follow us now. Um, there's a mailing list, so if you want to join, just email us. Um, we also have relations with Surge, who send out some of our messages. Um, our website, bursturology.com. And at BAUS, just like now, and at Dragon's Den sessions, we have the opportunity to talk to you guys. So talking about social media and Twitter, so in the last year, we've doubled our following. Um, we have key opinion leaders commenting on our work, 
uh, and we have our latest opportunities that are available advertised via Twitter. Um, some of our um, busy times include, for example, when there were committee applications recently, and there were more than 30 applications for three positions, and you can see around that time in EAU time, we had four and a half thousand impressions in a month. Um, the website, um, bursturology.com, has had 18,000 all-time hits. We get about 1,000 hits a month, and as you can see, it's an upward trend of interest, uh, with people looking at the website from all over the world. Um, if you type in Burst Urology on Google, it's the first website that comes up. And that's a preview of the website, and we're actually thinking about redesigning it to make it a bit more uh, user-friendly. Um, you can see some of the latest tweets, some of the opportunities, some of the publications, and what to do if you want to get involved. So what do we do? So any type of work that's asking an important and interesting question, um, all types, but ideally research. We like to do multi-center work that involves a large number of patients, but actually places a small burden on each trainee. Collectively, that makes a big impact. We want to work that ideally in the first phase anyway can be delivered by trainees in a short period of time and be published promptly. We aim to recognize all contributors with PubMed indexed authorship. So what type of research projects can be done in this type of collaborative setting? The best types of studies really are cohort studies, systematic reviews and meta-analyses, and randomized trials. So what could you do? Well, you could propose an idea for a research project which will evaluate and help develop if we think it's feasible. You could lead a project as a project lead. You could be part of a project steering committee. You could collect data for a study from a local site. You could help write a paper from the data collected. And you could present data from the study at international conferences. So what have we achieved? So we've produced a few papers on how we work and what we do. Um, we started to get a bit of attention with some work on CCT requirements and academic um, requirements from trainees. So this was some work which was carried out in conjunction with the Royal College of Surgeons and some SAC leads. Um, I'll talk about the impact of that later. Um, we've also started hitting some important journals who believe in our message. So this is the paper from the International Journal of Surgery, which I mentioned before. Um, combined with some support from the Bowes Academic Section and the paper that I mentioned, um, we did lobby the SAC chair um, about the authorship policy, which previously read two first author papers. Um, and he was happy to listen to our arguments and uh, did agree that to recognize collaborative research, um, for one of the first author papers, that would be the equivalent of two collaborative papers. So you can get recognized for your CCT by getting involved in collaborative projects. Um, we presented some academic work um, at various conferences. Um, this is now within about four to five months of our main project, MIMIC, um, being launched. We've presented it nationally and internationally um, by a number of trainees. And these are the ones which we're due to present at in the next few months. So as you can see, quite a few trainees have had the opportunity to be involved in this research and present these study findings. And if you don't believe me, here are a list of 100 more who have been involved in data collection from more than 70 sites in six countries. Um, in the last year, we've formed quite a few collaborations, um, some of which have been um, important organizations that have approached us, some of whom we've approached ourselves. And I'll go through some of these collaborations in the next few slides. Um, Education-wise, we want to try and contribute towards trainees being empowered to get involved in research. So last year, we co-produced a research methods course at BAUS. Um, this is actually available um, free of charge on the website. So if you wanted to see how to develop a research question when you're thinking about putting a proposal in, you can go on the website and go to the right point in the video. 
Um, there are also talks from statisticians on how to perform a systematic review or meta-analysis, and talks from Professor Dasgupta, who's right here, on what makes a good and publishable research paper. Um, we've started a new series, which is an educational video series on research methods. And these are short five to 10 minute videos which contain key topics in research methodology. And they're being led by our education lead, Arjun Nambiar. And we aim to produce one video a month, um, which is on a key aspect. So for example, the first one is produced on searching the medical literature. So we do believe that different methods of conveying um, research methodology are needed and videos are an excellent way of doing this. So this will hopefully reduce the effort you need to try and gain research method methodology knowledge and is a free source that we want anyone anywhere to be able to access. So the Institute of Cancer Research and um, BURST have formed a collaboration. Um, we advertise an opportunity for a number of trainees to sit on the steering committee of large national trials and the ICR are providing some training for them to understand trial processes. Um, we also provide a list of active portfolio trials to allow trainees to get involved and a means of getting involved. Um, and the ICR have agreed to contribute to our video series, so you'll be getting some lectures from <coughs> guys who are the best at what they do. At BAUS, we offer the opportunity for trainees to develop their own ideas and present them at a Dragon's Den session. And there's the opportunity to win a national prize here. Um, in the Northeast Deanery, we've produced a basic research and statistics teaching day in the regional SPR training program. And in London, we incorporated a GCP training day. So there are now about 35 SPRs who are ready to actively recruit to clinical trials. And there's no reason why they can't be co-PIs on important studies running at their site. Um, Prostate Cancer UK have invited us to contribute to their prostate cancer best practice pathways. And we're also developing educational aspects on the latest evidence for clinicians with them. Um, the University of Sheffield Clinical Trials Unit invited us to be a collaborator on an NIHR HTA grant for gabapentin in acute post-surgical pain. I'm going to talk about a few of our specific projects now as well. So uh, MIMIC is our first big cohort study, and I won't steal Tamer's thunder. I'll let him speak about it in detail. But the key point I wanted to make from MIMIC was that this was the largest contemporary known cohort assessing outcomes from acute ureteric colic. It's established an international burst network for dissemination of future studies. We hope that this will be high impact work and probably the best value for money any trials group would want. Um, it has been recognised in various forums. Um, EAU gave it a best poster in session prize. Um, ACIT, um, it was awarded the BISTIC prize, which is for the best collaborative research project across all specialties, which is, is quite something given that some of the other collaboratives have been going for about five years or more. Um, An ACIT medal was the prize for the best research at the whole conference, and it was runner-up in that session. So... If, just a taster of some of the other projects that are going on. So um, Alistair Lamb um, presented an idea at Dragon's Den, looking at the association of anxiety, that's patient anxiety, with intraoperative blood loss, with an interesting hypothesis that there is a neuroendocrine association with patient anxiety and the possibility of blood loss in an operation. So how did we help with that idea? Well, we gave a forum for presentation we carried out a peer review process. We helped establish the potential for launching the study on a larger scale. And we helped the conduct and analysis of a single center pilot study. So this is an idea of what will happen to your idea once it comes to us. So we talk about some of the key methodological factors in our committee. Um, we involve key clinicians who are on our advisory panel and external clinicians to peer review the idea. So here there is an anesthetist involved. Um, we get some of our specialist advisors to give us input as well. We then modify the proposal and carry out the um, planned project based on the feedback. And um, the results from this particular study were presented at Baus Academic and the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre annual meeting. So, torsion. 
So another idea presented at the Dragon's Den session was a study looking at delays in exploration of the scrotum. Now this is a really interesting topic and many urologists are interested in exploring this further. And after much discussion, we were really deciding what avenue within scrotal exploration we wanted to explore further. And one of the things we decided to do was carry out a systematic review in surgical technique, which is an area where there is no consensus. And we like to do things properly, so we Prospero register our systematic review, we produce a protocol, and we follow a strict timeline to try and produce these. So the EAU guidelines recommend uh, no particular preferred type of fixation or suture material. Um, the Pierce et al. paper showed that there are substantial variations in policies. And this particular review panel will hopefully go to some way to try and answer that question. So as you can see, there are trainees involved from all over the country. And we use software like Covidence, which allows collaboration across different regions and different times. So the research question for that particular piece of work is, in patients with testicular torsion who undergo orchidopexy, what are the surgical techniques used for orchidopexy and the subsequent outcomes of the fixed testicle? So, um, so far we've got down to um, full text analysis and we're whittled down to 13 papers which we're going to analyse in more detail. So hopefully next time we can give you a few more results on that. And the primary outcome there was torsion recurrence rate of ipsilateral testicle following orchidopexy for torsion. Secondary outcomes include testicular atrophy of ipsilateral testicle following orchidopexy, torsion recurrence rate and testicular atrophy of contralateral testicle and fertility. So one of the things we want to try and do from this study is the systematic review will help you identify what areas of research need to be done in. And we feel that there's probably room here for a consensus meeting. It may be done at BAUS next year on surgical technique with expert groups. And this is particularly important where there is a lack of high quality evidence in a particular area. So here's some peer review opportunities. So if you want to be able to learn some skills in critical appraisal, that can be used to demonstrate academic competencies at ARCP. And you'd like to shape the research that makes it through to publication in peer review journals, we're very happy to give trainees opportunities to be a peer reviewer for PubMed Index journals. There's a list of journals there that you can get involved with. And if you're interested, just drop me an email with your CV. Um, there are other opportunities as well. So we're very happy to have a close relationship with the BJUI. And one of the recent initiatives um, from the journal is to ask residents or trainees to produce podcasts, which are short summaries on important articles. And we're looking for keen trainees to get involved in that. So if you're interested, uh, just drop us an email to let us know and we will let BJUI know as well. So now on to identify, which is the next big collaborative study, which is what these leaflets are on the chairs next to you. So this is a study, which is actually a phase two study because we've done the pilot study. It looks at the investigation and detection of urological neoplasia in fast track patients referred with hematuria. So, so the background to this project is that we know that around 18.9% of patients with visible hematuria and only 4.8% of those with non-visible hematuria have bladder cancer. And we know that upper tract urinary cancer is also very rare. An NIHR HTA systematic review highlighted a lack of certainty in the optimal diagnostic pathway for management of hematuria and specified that future studies should address this. We know that there are a lot of patients who undergo investigation some of whom will undergo investigation unnecessarily, and perhaps we're not doing this in the most efficient way possible. And of note, NICE guidelines in this area have changed, raising the threshold for investigation. So we plan to do a prospective multi-center cohort study in 5,000 patients in 100 centers. The patients will be any patient referred with hematuria for investigation of suspected urinary tract malignancy. And we're gonna collect data on patient demographics patient presentation, investigation results, and pathology. 
So here are some of our aims. We aim to establish what current practices are for urinary tract cancer diagnosis in patients presenting with hematuria. We aim to establish contemporary prevalence rate for urinary tract cancer. Identify the diagnostic value of different strategies for identification of urinary tract cancers. Validate factors predictive of urinary tract cancer. Provide data to be able to offer patients a personalized approach to investigation of their hematuria and assess the cost effectiveness of different diagnostic strategies. So um, this is something that we're collaborating with the Birmingham Diagnostic Test Evaluation Research Group, who will assist with methodological aspects, statistical analysis, and health economics. And our aim is to work up an NIHR HT application with the results of Identify. So um, the pilot study has been carried out in just over 800 patients in seven centers. And we're looking to get people who are interested in taking part to register their interest in the meantime. And we will be in touch with those people with further details on how to register for the project. And we anticipate data collection will start towards the end of this year and go on for a few months next year, followed by data validation and data analysis. So how can you get involved? Well, the beauty is almost anyone can get involved. You just need a unit that performs flexible cystoscopy for investigation of hematuria, which is basically most units. Um, we aim that each centre recruits around 50 to 100 patients um, in patients who have been referred with hematuria and have a flexible cystoscopy and or imaging and or a TURBT. And key features of this are that it's a short data collection. It can be completed easily. We provide a red cap database to enter data easily. It can be carried out alongside clinical practice without difficulty. And we allow you guys to work in teams. Um, you can be at any level of training, and you can be a non-trainee. Um, you could be a specialist nurse if you wanted to take part too. All of the contributors would be PubMed indexed, collaborator, um, author, recognized. And if you're interested, please email lead trainee Sinan Paduri on the email address list there to register your interest now. Um, Sinan is here, and I'm sure he's got some leaflets to hand out to you if you haven't already got one. Um, and we're very happy to take any questions on that. Sinan's on hand to do that afterwards. So in the next 12 months, what do we plan to do? Well, we're going to publish the MIMIC results. Our aim is to develop a proposal for an RCT, which can be based on the MIMIC results. We want to launch Identify continue to provide free educational videos as part of our educational series, and plan a national consensus meeting for surgical technique in testicular torsion at BAUS next year. So um, just to say thank you to um, the Royal College of Surgeons, BAUS, the BAUS academic section, TUF and BJUI who have supported our endeavor. And I hope that I've demonstrated there are a wide range of different opportunities for trainees to get involved in, and trainees of all levels. And we want you to move from being consumers of research to becoming producers of research. Um, now, I'll, I'll end with the quote that I started with. Alone we can do so little, together we can do so much. Thank you. Um, so if anyone has any burning questions, I'm very happy to take them now. Um, otherwise, um, we could take them towards the end with a panel discussion. Okay, we'll move on to Tema Shah, who's the lead trainee for the MIMIC study. And he's going to tell you a bit about the results from MIMIC. Hi, good afternoon. So my name's Tema Shah. Um, some of you already know me. I'm one of the London trainees. Um, <laughs> one of the, I can say it again. Um, one of the first committee members, and I was the coordinator for Mimic. <laughs> um, we actually had quite a big Mimic study group, and actually had quite a big collaborative group as well. We had um, committee members from Burst, trainees, medical students, but we were fortunate enough to actually have a statistician on board. We had an IT data manager as well who was helping us. Um, and we had a consultant body that was also supervising the project. The plan for my talk today is to go over a bit about the project, a bit about our recruitment figures, and then some of our results. 
the, the actual data set is now with the statisticians, so we haven't got all of them, but I'll be able to give you some of them today. And then I'll finish with a, a few slides on, on what we've learned from MIMIC and what we feel are the key components for delivering such a project. So a bit of the background to MIMIC. When you look through the literature, the evidence is actually quite mixed on the role of inflammatory markers. Some say that that raised white cell count uh, means patients are more likely to pass their stone, whereas other papers say the complete opposite. Um, and our real interest was what role does white cell count or, or inflammatory markers have to play in patients who are discharged with conservative management uh, who have acute colic? And could some of this be used to guide management of these patients? The design was a snapshot of current practice, and within it, we embedded the question, are patients with a raised Y cell count more likely to need intervention? And it was a multi-center, trainee-led, and entirely trainee-delivered cohort study. And the aim was whether inflammatory markers have an association with, uh, with spontaneous stone passage or intervention. And as Viru said, this is the largest contemporary outcomes-based study for acute colic. Uh, putting it through in a PICO format, uh, anybody with this, all patients with a CT confirmed stone and a white cell count were included. Uh, the, our um, intervention group was anybody with a raised, were patients with a raised white cell count. Our comparator were patients with normal white cell count and our outcome was spontaneous stone passage defined by the need for no further intervention. And this meant that a, a clinical decision could be made on whether the patient was stone-free rather than uh, only imaging-based. We had a statistical analysis plan which we worked on from, from the outset, but in essence it was going to be a multivariable logistic regression. Um, and we would eventually build a model that would allow us to predict uh, the likelihood of spontaneous stone passage. We had various secondary, outcome, uh, secondary outcomes. One of them, which we're still looking at, is the role of uh, MET. It's taken us a little while to get here, about two and a half years. Um, and that's not just because we needed the project to, uh, to build the project, but actually it's because we needed the infrastructure for BURST to allow us to actually deliver a, such, a, such a study. And, much like a lot of our projects, BURST won the Dragon's Den Prize at Baus Academic about two and a half years ago. We went through a pilot phase. We then rolled it out last year uh, and are currently in the analysis phase of it. Again, some of you may have seen this graph before, but it is it's quite impressive. The chart on the right has two bars. It has a, a kind of orangey brown bar, which are the number of people who had signed up of, uh, and said they wanted to collect data. And the blue bar at the bottom, or the blue line at the bottom, uh, was the, uh, well, the number of patients' data that was entered into our database. We launched around October, and about a month later, we, hadn't, we had some interest, but not that, many patient, uh, not that many patients' data entered. Our target was, a, or our sample size was 1,000, um, and we wanted to get there by December. Probably due to advertising through various groups, we had a big surge in interest from trainees around November, and suddenly we had over 100 people who had signed up. And what this meant was we actually had representation across the whole of the UK, or almost all of the UK. We had representation in Ireland, and also, if the slide comes up, in Australia and New Zealand, which meant it was suddenly an international project. And with it, our, we reached our recruitment target within our uh, allotted time frame. But because we'd had so much interest and people were still registering, we decided to leave it open for another month. And that was a great idea because we ended up getting over 4,000 patients data from 71 sites and had about 200 collaborators who all took part in this. Looking at the results, so we had just over 4,000 patients' data. We excluded 1,000 of them because they had immediate intervention, but I will talk a bit about this group. Surprisingly, we only had 27 patients with incomplete data. 
75% were discharged with conservative management, and we had final outcomes on just over 2,500 which meant that 600 were actually lost to follow-up, which is quite a surprising high, surprisingly high figure. But overall, from this population, we had a spontaneous stone passage rate of 74%, which is in keeping with a lot of the, the studies on, on stone passage rates in Western populations. Looking across the whole cohort, about 48 years old, about one in three had a, a previous history of stones, um, and it was generally men rather than women who presented. White cell count was 10.6, neutrophils 8.1, CRP4. Nothing too exciting. This was interesting. Um, we all know that you can have a stone uh, and have a negative dipstick, but we found this in our data, so that actually 10% of patients have a completely negative dipstick for hematuria, yet have a CT-confirmed ureteric stone. Carrying on with some of our full results, median stone size was about five millimeters. Um, the majority were lower ureteric, and again, two-thirds had evidence of hydronephrosis or hydroureter on their scans. And across our population, about one in three received uh, some form of MET. And then on to our primary outcome. We put it all through a univariable analysis, and multiple factors came out as being potentially significant. But when we put it through a multivariable analysis, adjusting for a lot of the confounders, white cell count had absolutely no association with the spontaneous stone passage after discharge. But, as we all know, size and stone posi position are very, very strong indicators of whether a patient is about to pass that stone or not. There was a, a, a clear cutoff be between five millimeters bigger and lower, if you had a stone that was less than five, five millimeters and less, you had an 84% chance of passing that stone without the need for any intervention. But if it was bigger than five millimeters, that dropped to 42%. Similarly, stone position was very strong. Um, a lower ureteric stone had a three times greater odd of passing the stone than if it was proximal ureteric. And 80% of patients with distal ureteric stones actually passed their stones. And so our conclusion from this was that in patients presenting with acute colic who are suitable for conservative management, we should not be using white cell count to determine whether they should be discharged or whether we should be performing intervention. Stone size and position are important. And our aim is to produce a model and subsequently a risk calculator which will allow us to produce an individual patient's chance of passing that stone or, or, or risk of passing that stone or not passing that stone and hopefully we'll have that data soon because then we could effectively just punch in a few variables and be able to tell the patient you have an 80% chance or a 20% chance of passing the stone. A brief look at some of our secondary outcomes. We effectively had four groups of patients. The first set were the ones who had immediate intervention, presented as an emergency, had something done. The second group were the ones who were discharged with conservative management and then subsequently needed to have some form of delayed intervention. The third group passed their stones without any, any, any need for, 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 for any intervention. And then the final group were the group that were lost to follow up. And so looking at the first two groups, we asked the question, are there any differences between those patients who have to have immediate intervention versus those who um, have a period of conservative management? And then what were the reasons for them needing to undergo intervention? And the groups are relatively similar in their basic demographics. They also actually have no difference in their stone size. Uh, sorry, in their stone position. But they do have a difference in their stone size. So we tend to intervene in patients with bigger stones from the onset. But when you look at why we intervened, 20% of patients who had immediate intervention were actually pyrexial. And we looked at the reason documented for us intervening. So whether it was a nephrostomy or a stent, 30% had signs of sepsis. And if you compare this to only 2.5% in the delayed group, to the group who were discharged. And what that actually means is that in the 2,500 patients that we sent home with conservative management, only 0.6% of them came back 
needing to have intervention due to sepsis. So actually, that's a very low rate, and it shows actually we're probably pretty safe in our practice of discharging a lot of these patients. We also looked at that group that was lost to follow-up, and that's about 20%, so it's a significant number. And so I asked the question, who are they similar to? Are we, have we just left a group of patients with silent obstructing stones? And actually, we haven't probably. Um, they actually, they have the or they have similar sized stones to the patients who passed them spontaneously, and most of them had lower ureteric stones. So actually, they're the, they're the, they're the group of patients who are more likely to pass their stones. They are a bit younger, which may explain why they actually didn't show up for follow-up, might be a bit more mobile around the country. So concluding from that was that the rate of sepsis, or the rate for the need for intervention for sepsis is very, very low in the patients that are discharged. But our follow-up protocols are generally inadequate. We have 20% of patients who are lost to follow-up. There's no documentation on what happened to these patients. So something does need to be done about that. But it's probably likely they passed, the, passed their stone anyway because it was small and they were lower ureteric. So we're, on balance, we're probably safe, but it still, still needs work. So our future work, first one will be to develop this risk calculator. Hopefully, we can make it available uh, via a website or via an app. We haven't completely decided that. Um, the next step will be to work on some of our follow-up pathways in the UK because one in five patients is, is lost to follow-up. And then ultimately, as Viru mentioned, we are looking at setting up a randomized control trial probably in the next year or two based on the results from MIMIC. That's MIMIC done. Um, and I'll end with a few slides on what we learned from it and what we feel are the key components for delivering such a project. There's eight steps that all lead to success. I'll quickly whiz over them because probably short in time. Um, First is the idea. Um, it has to be simple. For a trainee-led project, it's going to be high volume. It has to be simple, non-contentious, high volume. And, and ideally, something with a short follow-up. The protocol is key. Um, Viru's explained a bit about how we have a multi-stage process for all our, for our protocols. Initially, a, one or two trainees work on the idea, develop it. It then goes through two, stage, two stages of peer review. One is internal, and then the second is external via an expert consultant body. On top of that, having statistical input early on is very helpful, particularly with sample size calculations and deciding what the authorship policy is from the outset so no one, no, there are no confusions later on down the line. Approval, uh, approvals for such projects. HR is very clear on what's defined as research, audit, service evaluation, and, and mimic uh, much like all of our other projects, are reviewed by an R&D um, uh, office, and ours was the UCL department, and they effectively said it's a service evaluation, which meant we, we didn't have to go through REC to do this, or through ethics, formal ethics. But on top of that, each individual site, so all of those 71 sites, registered it locally, and so each local department also reviewed it. And although no one re refused it, we did have some uh, conversations with various departments about about the project itself. Database, Excel's great, we can do it at one site, maybe two sites, but what our pilot showed was that actually it's completely inadequate for use across multiple sites. And we decided to use an online database that everybody can access anywhere in the world. Um, we used REDCap, we had university links, which meant actually it ended up being free for us because it needs uh, backroom support from, a, from an IT technician, um, but it has all the approvals for the NHS um, uh, and is anonymous. Pilot, as I've already said, the pilot was key for us in how we changed our study, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a big step for any such project, um, and we adapted it quite significantly, and as I said, we, we changed our database based on the pilot, and that was only across, I think, six sites. Sites and main phase. These two kind of go hand in hand. They're, they're big steps and they actually need a team. You cannot coordinate so many sites by yourself and there was a whole team working on this um, which, which require um, advertising but also identification of sites, registration of sites, chasing up 
uh, all these various audit department approvals, making sure the data comes in. Um, and so there's quite a lot of work that is needed for that, but is, is a very important step. And then finally, analysis. What we learned is that we need a validation stage. We can get all this data in, but we don't know, um, we don't know its quality. And so we actually individually checked each individual site's data, um, highlighted any, any outliers, any inconsistencies, and actually fed these back to the original site and said, please, can you clarify these? And if they couldn't, we dropped that data line, uh, but actually most people came back to us and were able to, to edit their data. Um, the main thing actually was that it was data errors that we saw. So. And then statistician, the data is with him now, so we'll, I'll add a bit more on what we've learned uh, from that stage later on. And those are the key components that help mimic succeed, but actually the key components for absolutely any project, uh, whether it's service evaluation, audit, or research. Thank you. Thank you, Tamer. Um, does anyone have any specific questions for Tamer? Um, Ravi? Thank you. Um, so first of all, congratulations on this. I mean, I'm full of praise for all of you guys who have made this work. It was, I believe, three years ago in this very session that the idea for Burst as a research collaborative came up and you've achieved so much. And I think that everyone who's been involved in this should be incredibly proud of themselves because it's an amazing achievement. Um, uh, and then moving on to my point, it, I'm not a stone surgeon, but just uh, I just had a little issue with one of your um, conclusions about the patients who are lost to follow up. Mm. So surely that's a good thing that the 20% of patients who you've lost to follow up all have small stones mm -hmm. and you've already shown that only 0.6% of your patients ever come back with sepsis. So your conclusion of saying we need to improve our follow-up protocols, surely that's uh, you know, slightly misplaced yeah, because you're then following up patients who never needed to be followed up. Yeah, I take your point. So it's a, it's a good thing that they have small stones and they're lower ureteric, but actually we, not all of them do pass their stone. And also for governance purposes, we should actually know what the outcome from our treatment was for a patient. So in essence, these guys have been seen in, in A&E and never been seen again um, by anyone. So... For academic reasons. Well, it, from a healthcare, so uh, from a healthcare, we got lucky actually. That could have, the data could have shown that these patients maybe had larger stones, but luckily they don't. So as I said, it is a good thing. It means that we're, we're probably safe, but we shouldn't be losing, we shouldn't be losing that many patients. Um, to any form of follow-up. Um, Nitin? I think, um, just want to congratulate you guys on having burst. I mean, this seems to be a great project, so congrats for that. It looks a very good group uh, where you can carry out research uh, together as a group. So, very good for you again. Uh, about sepsis, my, my concern is again, the 0.6% of patients did you ever have any deaths in those 0.6 percent? We didn't specifically collect death, but we did have an <laughs> other know. box, and I don't think anybody wrote okay. death in there. Okay, um, it's, so. it's just that as, as a consultant, when you have to go and stand in a coroner's court yeah. and explain a death to a family and the coroner, it, it, it can be quite tough. So, I mean, this is a very small number, 0.6 percent. 16 patients. Yes, out of two, uh, uh, two I know. Thousand. But when you have to go and stand in the coroner's court, even one patient can be uh, too, ma too many. No one told us that anyone died. I'm sure <laughs> they would have. Good. I'm sure they would have. Okay. okay. But we didn't care. Um, no, no, that's good. And, and how can you uh, try and get more SPRs into this group? Because uh, uh, is everybody part of this group? Are all most people part of this group? Or is it just a small number of SPRs that form burst? So, I mean, it's open to anyone. In terms of who took part in this project, we've probably got more than 100 SPRs, but that's probably about a third of the total that we would want. So now that we've shown what we can do, um, I think it would be a natural progression, for example, for Identify, where we're looking for at least 5,000 patients for all trainees to get involved. And when you take um, comparisons to general surgery and their collaboratives, their training program directors expect them to be involved in training um, collaborative projects. So I think we're, we should move towards that. 
Yeah. I mean, we have about 338 SPRs in urology. So, you know, there's still many more that could join. And I find that uh, SPRs in district hospitals don't always take part in these studies. So it'd be nice if we could push them as well to join this group. It'd be great. One of the things that will help is if um, consultants like yourself can go back to your centres and say, guys, you need to get involved in stuff like this. Um, it's an easy way for you to do that, and your support would be greatly appreciated. Um, we've got one question down here, please. Hi, I'm Francesca, one of the CTTs at Worthing. Um, just one quick comment, really. Mm. Um, with regard to the patients who are lost to a follow-up, I know mm. that, yes, they did have small stones, but some of the times that I've worked with consultants, when, of course, when you discharge them and you tell them if you do end up spontaneously passing your stone and you know that you've passed it, then, mm. of course, you can, to take off the pressure of our, say, one-week or two-week stone clinic, then the patient will call up and say, no, I'm not coming back because I've passed my soon. So if it's documented, it would mm. have been logged. If it's not documented, then it hasn't effectively happened. And that's yeah. the same but often point about medical hasn't. legal work. If it's not documented, we never did it. Mm. Um, yeah, they may have. And, and some of these may have made some contact in some form. Yeah, because having collected <laughs> data for Mimic, then that isn't in the patient notes. And of course, mm. it'll be the secretary <laughs> or the admin people who are receiving the phone call and then cancelling the appointment, but that doesn't get written in paper mm. notes. I guess it depends whether the hospital has electronic notes or not. Mm. Mm. There'll be multiple factors for that group, and it is something to look into, particularly when we go down to looking for pathways. Yeah, and if they then have the patient information that they know dietary changes, etc., so that they don't get another stone. Uh, in the beginning of the presentation, I don't know whether it was yourself or your colleague, you mentioned uh, the, Im the high impact or the good quality of this research. Was this a high uh, quality research and how did you measure that? Um, I think the urological community will measure how, how much of an impact this has, I think. Um, from our point of view, we did it in a, in a robust manner. We, we, we followed our own steps in how you design a project. Um, and, and as I said, it has been reviewed multiple times. So we, we built it to be as, uh, as high quality as possible. Whether it's got high impact, time will tell, I think. Um, we, we think it will because it is, we, don't, we, don't, we have not seen a data set similar to that in the literature for, for at least for some decades anyway. Echo those congratulations. Um, well done on burst and the dint of perseveration, perseverance rather. Um, with regards to mimic and the results, perhaps I didn't see it on one of the bigger tables, but is there any difference in renal function in those being intervened on um, immediately? And Off the top of my head, there wasn't. Yeah. There, were, there wasn't. But it, the, the full data set is with our statistician. Off the top of my head, it wasn't. Yeah. It may be a threshold effect, by the way, with renal function. So there may be, if we set a limit, then there probably, there might be, but we haven't got that far. Howard? Uh, just in, rela in relation to this study and then the Identify study, um, how do you deal with the issue of whether the cases are consecutive or not coming from centres and whether that may introduce a bias? Um, so for Mimic, I mean, it, you have to rely a little bit on the trainee, but there was the, the method we we used for selecting patients were, would allow you to collect consecutive patients. So whether that was from any admissions or, or CT records, you would have to go consecutively down. So you'd assume you would remove a bit of bias, but that bias exists in any study. People can pick and choose, unfortunately, who they offer a start trial to or not. Um, so with this, we assume we removed, we tried our best to remove that bias. Um, I think Identify will be relatively similar, actually. It'll be anybody coming in through a hematuria clinic. You can't ultimately stop the clinician deciding not to enroll a patient's data or not. Um, I'm not sure how best we can enforce that.
Okay, any other questions? Oh, Kenneth? Um, you're talking about streamlining the process. With such a small rate requiring follow-up, does this actually highlight a need for changing the process for follow-up? So would like a nurse-led telephone phone call two weeks be a much more efficient use of service rather than the kind of two-week standard follow-up? Yeah, potentially. Um, I can't remember. I, I think I read some... It was a paper presented a couple of times for the last few months. I think it might be from Brighton, possibly, and they did something similar. So you're right, it may be that we change the pathway for all of these patients, um, something like a telephone-led or a nurse-led follow-up um, a few weeks down the line, three, four weeks, to see how, they, how they're doing effectively. And that could have a big impact on resources if you're not having to bring them back to the clinic. So, Kenneth, I think you make a really valid point there. So um, some of this data tells us, based on the main confounding factors, for your patient... What is the chance of them spontaneously passing a stone? So you could tailor your follow-up based on what risk category they fall into. So I think that's an important potential outcome of this type of study. Mm. Okay, one question at the back. Um, it's mainly just to elaborate on the Brighton situation. They actually have a virtual clinic for their follow-up. I know it's not really the realms of what we're here to discuss today, but I just thought I'd say that. So that's how they've managed to cut down their follow-up to an outpatient clinic. Okay, um, thank you very much, Tamer. So um, for our next speaker, um, I'd like to present uh, Ben Chalikan. Um, we're very lucky to have a busy clinician who's had a successful academic practice present to you guys on what he feels the role of the clinician should be in the NHS from a slightly higher up point of view. I'm, uh, I'm not sure I'm a higher up point of view at all, Vera. Thank you very much for, uh, for uh, asking me. Um, and it's a great honor to be here. I'm, uh, I'm really standing in for, uh, for John McGrath, who, uh, as many of you will know, has, uh, has had an accident and wasn't able to come. And I've been uh, liaising with him a little bit and kind of inspired by, by some of the things that he's got going. Um, most of my talks, for anyone who knows me, have lots of videos of robotics and, uh, and maybe some jokes. Um, this doesn't. I have uh, had a little look inside myself about uh, where I've got to, who I am, and I just part of it is integrated ab amongst where I've got to or where I'm trying to go to and perhaps some advice. Um, I was speaking to my dad quite a lot, actually, because he's a true academic. Um, and uh, about really what this is all about. Why, why, what is the purpose of, uh, of clinical research? Well, science is to make a better world, um, ultimately. Um, but how, who, where? So what I wanted to just do to start with, and uh, I'm going to throw this on you, Vera, because I want to make two slides here that we're going to tweet. One of the challenges, and one is the solutions. And so anybody who's got a challenge, a, thing, a problem, that's something that's stopping them, we do this at guys a bit. We have a, a round the room. You may have heard a certain person say that. Um, and, we've, and we've formed a slide. And we've formed just, you know, just a list of five or six points. I think we can probably do that between us with, with the topics that come up. Personally, if it's a personal issue, I haven't got enough time. That's like the standard phrase to anybody who says they're too fat to go running or... Uh, can't do something for you to check a blood result or, you know, you have to have, make time. Life is about time. There's so many challenges to our time and uh, if I could understand and manage my time better, uh, then uh, I'd, I'd be better. But we all, uh, if you want a job done, you ask a busy person. I don't have any support. I'm stressed enough just doing my job. Um, the unit doesn't really have any structure. There's no real precedent for doing a lot of research here. We do a couple of audits in the you know, we might put them into the regional meeting, and there's not really a system, there's not really infrastructure for it. Those are the things that I was thinking that one might say. Um, what kind of research might you be able to get into? So I think what we're talking about here is not me uh, next to Professor Prokhardas Gupta in an academic teaching hospital at Guy's or at UCL or in Cardiff. Or We're talking about a standard place, a medium-sized DGH. That's what I'm thinking about. Basic research, that is challenging. It's not impossible, but it's challenging. And I hate the word cellular research linked with basic research because there are other types of basic research that involves robots, for instance. Um, so basic research. Clinical investigation of things we can do. 
and, we, um, and that, is, that is obviously trialing things. We're not going to be able to do massive drug trials in a, in a I'm not going to name a place because it'll prejudice me or you against a, a place. We're not going to be able to do a, a big drug trials because they're probably not going to come to us. But there are other things we can do, and we'll touch on those. But audit, and one of my great mentors, Declan Carhill, one of the great things he always said, if, if you don't know how you're doing, you can't improve it. And just to start, I mean, all science starts with measurement. So the first principle is everything we do, we've got to be able to measure. Because if you don't measure it, you don't know what you're doing, and you, they've got no chance of improving it. So you've got to have that philosophy of investigation. And why would you do it? Well, you might make it your, your, your profession better. You might make the institution better. I mean, I'm quite lucky that I quite like the place I work at, but you don't always have that feeling of total love if you're a trainee. It might have hit you pretty hard with a few shifts. But what about just for yourself to actually further your, your career? There's a f couple of famous urologists in my year who work in smaller hospitals, and they've now subsequently, a lot of them, come back to me five or six, seven years in, we're all into our consultant job, and said, I'm kind of doing what I'm doing. I, I can do it now. The operation, stone, robot, incontinence, whatever I'm doing, but is there any chance we could collaborate back with you? Because I kind of want another thing. We don't get students. We don't have research fellows. If it's in your job description, if you've got academic PAs, then, of course, it's going to be part of what you do. Uh, I haven't got that, so it's, I haven't got a, a time per week to do it. But ultimately, of course, it's, you want to, it to benefit uh, some sort of uh, patient impact because that's, that's why we're doing it. And, you know, you've, you've, you've illustrated so elegantly there with, uh, with your, uh, your collaborative, which is, you know, really one of the most amazing things I've ever seen trainees come up with. And probably the most amazing thing coming to this meeting for 15 years. Absolutely staggering. So just about me, this isn't really to big me up, but it's just to tell you the points of, uh, of what happened when. I was a research fellow. I met him, which is quite lucky, because then we got to do a few projects. But whilst I was an SPR, I kept a certain attachment to people that you might want to call mentors, people you thought were, 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 uh, were worth keeping in touch with, and they gave you some projects. So all you guys out there thinking, oh, well, the guy I'm with is not really into research, he doesn't have to be. We've shown it here. You can be a collaborative. You just hook in with somebody who gave you the laugh project. But for God's sake, if someone gives you a project, deliver it. Because if you don't deliver project one, you don't get two, three, and four. And if project one's rubbish, just say, look, this is not really happening. I can't do one because you've asked me to count something that's uncountable. Can I have something else? But don't just park it for six months because that person won't come back to you. I didn't know Proko was going to be here, so I, didn't, I said cheeky, cheekily beforehand, he really wanted me to be a clinician scientist, but I don't think I was clever enough. Um, I didn't get the grant, and it didn't happen. Um, I failed on what does T stand for in MRI. I can't believe that. I spend most of my life now talking about prostate cancer and MRI, and on the day of that interview, nine years, seven years ago, I didn't know what T stood for. Um, but I've got some papers and some chapters and some presentations and writing some books, and I've written a book with, uh, with, uh, with Vera, which is, which is nice. So what sort of things could you do? If I wasn't looking at guys, I could look at what sort of things could we get involved with. Well, we had some basic science labs with Kings, and so we got attached to them. I found a wacky guy in Maxfax who wanted to do some stuff on Sentinel nodes, so we did a little paper on that. I collaborated with a plastic surgeon, and we took out some lymph nodes for melanoma, and we wrote that up. And we started to do some, some comments, and we got involved in databases. And then you start getting the biobank stuff has come in. But each year, we have a BSc student. Now, that's easy for me. I just give them a project. We write it up. We do a comment. It's, you can't do that if you haven't got any students. What about if you've just got your standard juniors and staff grade people? Um, and we'll come on to that. So we've written up our surveillance cohort. We've hooked on to Cameron Ahmed. You may have met him, unbelievable. He's got about 350 papers, and he's not a consultant yet, and he's writing every training and mentoring guidelines. But uh, if you've got a connection, and we meet them here, BJUI, we like comments, don't we? We like comments. They get heavily cited. They're not part of the denominator. So if you've got something to say, just as a starter for a project to see you out of interest, you can write something. So I've never done this before, because I thought, well, I, my feeling is I'm getting a bit knackered at times, and maybe I've not really done much in the last couple of years. And these are my papers. And I say I've got 200. It is exactly 200, because it was 199 or last week, and it was 200 yesterday, And to see where they all came. And I thought I was getting completely sort of uh, sidetracked with just taking out prostates and doing partials. But actually, the collaboration has, gone, has become more so in the last few years. And I think that's probably because you're more well-known and you get involved with things. So it kind of just happens once you, once you get on the, 
on the roller coaster. Very talked about becoming a reviewer. I introduced him to the International Journal of Surgery, which has been a great thing for both of us to get involved with. And of course, it's worth reviewing things. Then you know about stuff. It's your, it's your CPD. If you don't know about stuff, how do you know what stuff there is to know about and what needs knowing about? So review for things, and uh, you get sent some great papers, and you get some, some contacts there. So this is where I'm going to embarrass myself. I thought this is ResearchGate. Do you use ResearchGate? You can look yourself up. And I thought, hey, I'm doing quite well here. Um, I've got an RG score of 46. Prokop's got an RG score of 49. And my dad's got an RG score of 46. What does that mean? I don't know. It's something to do with ResearchGate. But I thought, hey, I'm doing quite well here. H index. First thing you know what your H index is? So 25, yeah. The others, Prokop, 40. My dad, 55. That's what counts. So that's about how often you're cited in true journals. It's about the real impact you have. If you're interested in your research, you know, REF and re returns, you're going to be interested in that. But you can start looking up this stuff, and you can get into this. And you can earn points, if you want to, for just answering questions. And it's like a sort of Twitter for, uh, for research people. So if you're in your department, how are you going to make some clinical research happen? We're talking about clinical research in a DGH. I think you've got to have a meeting. If you really want to make it serious, you're meeting just with your mentor, with your consultant, two or three of you after the ward round, go for coffee, have a chat, have a research meeting, badge it as a research meeting, right? have some sort of format to it, and then you've got a little team. And the staff doctors, who will often be there doing a very good job, some of them will be interested. I've managed to recruit people to get involved with trials and infuse people, juniors, you'll have medical students, and submit a few abstracts. Where's the easiest place in the, uh, the world to get an abstract into? Well, you know, hopefully the RSM takes most things for the urology section. The World Congress of Endourology. I only know one person has ever managed to fail to get uh, abstract into, uh, into there. Um, but they're worth it because they're international things and you can get, and you get known. Publish a few studies that work and ultimately measure stuff. Because if you don't know what you're doing, you can't improve it. So we all have to do the BAUS audit. So your own unit, whether it be slings, whether it be PCNL, get into that. So I sit on the BAUS Oncology Council and we have uh, a little, it's a very easy A4 sheet that people fill in if they want to do a research project. So I'm looking right now for someone to do this with me for partial nephrectomy. We write a thing about partial nephrectomy and we look at robotics and lap and open and we look at the outcomes over the last four years. It's a complete winner because it's there. The data's been there. We've just submitted 2016. And we've got three or four of those come up every meeting. So what are you going to look at in urology in a, small, in a smaller hospital? Well, you're not going to look at drug trials, but you can look at devices and techniques. If someone does a funny thing, prone, supine, PCNL, you could look at that. They do a different kind of sling. They've got an interest in partial orchidectomy. They do something a bit different to other people. They've always done it that way. Someone else comes along and they do it differently. Perfect, we'll do a little cohort. We can look at how you train people, how you teach people. There's a lot of easy stuff out there about new simulators, about new things as they come in. Um, but I just looked at this, what we've done, people with a new flexible ureteroscope or a new lithotripter or a new harmonic scalpel, ligature type thing. They're the sort of things that allow you to do some of this clinical research. So the easy wins. I'm thinking about your collaboration. You're looking at easy, you're looking at answering common issues across a country. But what about things where everybody's got one or two, but no one's got enough to write a paper, but everyone's got a couple? Not really sure what we're meant to do with ductal. We always have one every month or so, but let's, we could nail it with that. Or RPF. Or some of these rarer things that we as Great Britain can do, and Northern Ireland, can do in a way that America can never do, because other than the Michigan Collaborative, they're not really joined up in a way that, that, uh, that are, they are. So the stone and the post-op pathways, what about looking at whether you need to leave drains after radical prostatectomy? What about looking at single-shot spinal versus PCA versus tap block? You know, things that would, just, that, that would just change practice for the better of patients easily, you could collect the data. So anything that comes to your unit, any unique niche areas in your, in your unit. So the collaboration, you've got it all here. Twitter is just, for me, people who aren't in medicine who meet me at dinner parties go, I'm on Twitter, and they look at you like, you must be an utter freak, because all they're thinking of is Justin Bieber or, or Trump or Obama. 
Whereas Twitter here today, you know, I can review the whole impact of a meeting by looking at hashtag BAUS17, even though I'm not there and see what's on there. But I'm sure you all there are there. And the other thing about having a group is that you guys will have a reception, you'll have a niche, and you'll, have a, and you'll be able to collaborate. And you've got enough big hitters um, in this room that they will put you in touch with people in areas that you're interested in, uh, in researching into. So the challenges, of course, are there. There's no fixed research sessions for people. You haven't got a team unless you make it. If you start doing decent research, you need to go to good, good clinical practice, and you can start collaborating. But I think Burst has given us a, uh, you know, a framework to do that, and uh, maybe we'll chat about some of those things I've just been, been thinking out over the last few days, as, as I'd be very happy to collaborate with you guys on those things. So thank you very much for inviting me. And not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. Um, and of course, anyone who's never made a mistake has uh, never tried anything new. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ben. So, so we've got to make our slides. So I've got to hear the challenges, yeah? Okay, so from your experience in the audience, have you come across any barriers that you'd like to talk about in getting involved in research? that we can put up on this slide? Access to good statisticians. <laughs> really good one. <laughs> one that we're facing at the moment, Alistair. <laughs> yeah, I, I wrote a study about, with Tim O'Brien about red, uh, red light for green light and about the, just, just, we wrote a paper about the difficulties of starting a trial rather than actually doing the trial. It, it's just mind blowing. Yep, at the back. A access to medical information, so having to go through notes versus electronic notes, obviously it's much easier if it's all electronic. Yep. Documentation. Even the smallest thing of patients is an integral resource. Especially, I think, in the previous session, someone mentioned one patient had passed his choice and they saw a secretary or they saw a control person. So the documentation is not there. Okay, um, one more, David. Changing jobs and losing access to data and losing access to structures and process. And Tamer? Well, I can add one as well. I think we touched on this. It's getting something funded, um, especially if you're going to do certain research. You can't do it without a grant, and that's quite a big step, usually. Okay, and... Um, ways of overcoming them? Yeah, I've got an answer for all of those straight away, of course. Um, well, uh, the collaborative approach makes a lot of these things easier. A statistician, when I did research, needed to be in your institution. They don't even need to be in your country now because a data set is a data set, and if you've got a good person, then, then, then they can look at it wherever. And, of course, the problem with, I've had with statisticians, as soon as you find a good one, then everyone starts using them, they get completely overwhelmed and they go, uh, yeah, stop. So, um, but th I think that using uh, st statisticians who are not necessarily part of your unit and us collaborating with who the people are. We have in the audience here Louise de Winter, who is uh, Chief Executive of the Urology Foundation. I'd like to highlight, not just because I love that charity as well, but also that they have, they have, small, they have small and larger research uh, grants out there that we can apply for. And we have, we have a call coming up um, various times of the year. Next call, Louise. October. Um, and Professor John Kelly is, chairs the, uh, the uh, academic committee for, that, for those grants. And I'm very grateful they sent me to Australia on fellowship. That was just a technical grant, but they do basic research grants of all sorts. And everything is potentially uh, submissible to those sort of uh, funding opportunities. Okay. Um, yeah, I think you've all raised some valid points about problems of getting involved in research. Um, Away, and to address your point about um, research and ethics, um, it's an important barrier. I think in the UK, we're actually quite good compared to other countries. So um, I've opened a trial in about 25 centres in different countries, and some of their ethics approval processes take even longer than ours. So ours is actually 
not just slightly good, very good. You can actually get um, a remote um, ethics approval panel. Uh, you don't need to be in the same room as them. Um, they have the certain time limits within which they need to give you a decision by. Um, the problem is the paperwork. Um, it needs to be done. It's not easy. But it needs to get done in order to get the appropriate approvals for it to go through. Um, not all projects will need ethical approval. Um, but local R&D departments can assist with things that don't necessarily need it, and they can give you an exemption. Um, there are, um, you can go through the formal IRAS process and get an ethics approval, um, which can be expedited if it's a project that doesn't require um, significant um, uh, review. So there are certain ways around it, but I agree that, can, that the IRAS form can be quite a difficult form to take on, especially when you've not done one before, and it can be time consuming, which is why I'm working as part of a network which has done it before, can make things a bit easier. Um, on to David's point, um, you mentioned trainees moving on, and that's a really important point. Um, you want to be able to complete a project whilst you're at a centre. Um, and one of the advantages of a trainee collaborative is most of the projects are designed to be completed within the time that you're at one centre. And um, we try to time projects um, for that, so they don't tend to overlap with job changeovers. Um, when the collaborative um, moves on to slightly higher levels of evidence type studies, then if a trainee is contributing to the study in different centres, they will also be recognised. Um, and if all the trainees are contributing, it makes it an easier process to run. Um, so there are ways of overcoming some of those issues too. Um, any other comments from the floor or points that they want to make? I think we've had quite a good discussion here. Broker? Do, do the trainees come up to you uh, with ideas for research or tasks saying, would the BERT collaborative be willing to accept this? And you've shown an example. And if so, how do you decide on the feasibility So um, uh, we do get uh, people emailing us. Um, the primary way in which people present their ideas have been at the Dragon's Den sessions at Baus and Baus Academic. And there we have a, a peer review panel who are the dragons, uh, usually with a methodologist and neurologist and someone from the collaborative. So the way we review whether it's feasible or not is um, we do an internal peer review process, so the committee but an external peer review process, so experts in that area of the field. And you've got to get through each part of the process to get on to the next. So we won't take an idea and get back to them in three months. If they send us an email and we know that clearly, if, if it needs 100,000 patients, we're going to tell them straight away. If we think it's feasible and deliverable within the stage of the evolution of the collaborative, then we will say we're considering this and it's going through peer review. Okay, um, thank you, Ben. Uh, thank you, Tamer. Um, and with that, I'd like to draw this session to a close. Um, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, thank you for those uh, who have contributed to MIMIC and the Burst Research Collaborative projects. Um, myself and uh, Sinan will be here at the end if you have any questions you want to ask us uh, separately. Um, thank you, and I hope you enjoy BALS. <laughs>